This is John Warren, publisher of the San Diego Voice and Viewpoint newspaper, coming to you with our program from the desk of the editor. I'd like to remind you each week that the Voice and Viewpoint has served San Diego County for more than 63 years in uh, all 17 cities, unincorporated areas, and 89 zip codes. We are available for free on the Internet. You may download our app in the Google or Apple Store, or you may subscribe in terms of home delivery, or pick the paper up at a retail outlet or single copies through newsstands. And so we've made it available. Uh, Our motto with the paper has been that a people without a voice cannot be heard, and that our primary focus is serving San Diego's African and African-American communities. And so this program that we do here is an extension of that voice that we seek to provide for people. And we're very honored this evening as uh, Dr. Leonard Thompson and I do this program to have Ms. Francine Maxwell with us, who's co-chair of uh, of the uh, Black uh, Men and Women uh, Organization here in San Diego, which has been here for almost 15 years serving the community. She is uh, one of the workers of the community. Her hands is, her hands are in everything. She keeps up with meetings and budgets and committees and people. And sometimes with the newspaper, I just feel like uh, I can't really publish nothing unless I have a conversation with her. So um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Thompson as our uh, host here, and then we will uh, – uh, hear from Ms. Maxwell, and I hope that one of the things she'll do, uh, we got some interesting topics lined up this evening. We're going to be discussing the, the, the Board of Supervisor pending vacancy for the Superfessorial District 4. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Tenant Protection Order. We have Council Member Monica Montgomery Stepp, who is going to be joining us on Zoom uh, shortly. Um, she's uh, leaving another meeting, and we're going to uh, have a full discussion, and one of the things that we're going to do uh, after Dr. Thompson is we're going to uh, have Ms. Maxwell uh, just mention uh, some of the dynamics of the uh, budget because that's something that's rarely discussed, and we have an opportunity to hear. So, Dr. Thompson. Well, well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you all for tuning in tonight. This is going to be a very exciting discussion that we're going to have tonight. I want to give some ground rules, you know, give some ground rules. You can right. call in and give an audio question where this is not a debate. You can call in at 858-251-6111, and um, you can ask a question or jump in on the discussion. For those of you guys that are listening through Zoom tonight, we're going to ask that all of you guys will put your questions in the feed. We're going to ask you not to jump in verbally, but to put your questions in the feed. And I want to say thank you so much. Uh, Brother Chris Mitchell is online, and so many people are on the line from all over the country uh, right. for this. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited that I got Dr. Warren in the house, and I got uh, man, uh, <laughs> 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 Ms. Francine Maxwell. You know, I always call you Candidate Maxwell because you, you're you always on the cutting edge of all that's going on in this city. So, Dr. Warren, those are the ground rules tonight. I'm going to send it back over to you. Well, at this point, I would love for Ms. Maxwell to uh, – Give us any opening comments, you know, because you're involved in everything. You chair our meeting once a week with Black Men and Women United. Uh, you do an outstanding job. You're one of the co-chairs, um, and we've been rotating that chairmanship, but you've done so well that we don't even touch it anymore. And so we know that you serve this community well as president of the NAACP. You keep up with the school board, the city council, board of supervisors, all of these things that are going on. And so this discussion this evening is to just pry to air some of the things that are happening. And uh, we just want to give you a few minutes to go ahead and and uh, take it. If you want to do that budget thing first, we are going to get back to the supervisorial issue, but we want, to, we want to touch on some of these other issues first. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Warren and Dr. Thompson, for allowing me to come in this evening. It is with honor that I sit with some of my two favorite doctors. <laughs> um, I'm concerned that um, we don't have enough traction in the community as it pertains to the budget that the mayor of San Diego has just put out. 
We have a lot of people that um, are combing through it, hopefully. And I implore people to go on the city website to the independent budget analysts and watch Budget 101, because that's your opportunity to make sure that you'll familiarize yourself with what's missing and what you want to ask for for the May revise. It's very important that people see that the mayor has decided to spend money on a dog park versus making sure that we had drop-in um, facilities for um, people to cool off. Rather, they were having a mental breakdown, or re and even though mental health is a county, we have a lot of things that the city can do with our city tax dollars. Um, the cannabis was something that stood out, and as you shared a few minutes ago, the tenants' rights ordinance um, with all the loopholes, and the media decided, of course, to talk to the landlords because those were better sound bites because tenants and tenant activists would become emotional because it is emotional when you walk past some of our unsheltered neighbors and they are home. San Diego, California is their home. They just happen to be unsheltered right now. Well, I, I think you are totally right, Ms. Maxwell. And it's so important. Uh, yesterday when the city council was uh, going to this matter from two until about nine 45 last night, and uh, they had all of these landlords that came up, I'm sure, uh, tenants too, but I, I guess I came on when the landlords were making their pitch. And one guy came up and talked about how much he loved uh, his uh, residents. They were his customers, and whenever somebody moved in, he gave them a bottle of wine, and at Christmas he sent them a box of C's chocolates because they needed the, the drink because it was emotional in terms of moving. And if you listen to them, you would, you would have thought that uh, – the people seeking somewhere to live were the, were the criminals in the whole process. And so we're glad that um, the ordinance did not give all of what was desired. It was a step forward. Uh, it was an expansion upon uh, Senate Bill 1482, mm -hmm. which was the state's version of giving more. And one of the big changes uh, that people argued was that where people uh, have to move, where the state uh, bill, I believe, gave one month, uh, they wanted to give two months here, and if it was a senior or a handicapped person, give them three months uh, rent like a severance. Uh, but you really, it didn't deal, really deal with some of the real issues that are involved there. And I think one of the big problems in San Diego is that after the pandemic, we had the freeze on rents, and after that freeze expired, then many landlords moved to do evictions. Yes. And so now those evictions are on people's records, even though some of them got evicted out of the hardships of the pandemic unemployment and a whole bit. But we have uh, an apartment owners association that calls the shots. And I like to remind people that a lot of our judges are landlords. And so you can't be expecting justice if you're concerned about what's happening in the hen house and the fox is holding the door. Um, and so we, we've got big issues there. They're not over. And uh, I want to salute the uh, San Diego uh, Tenant Union for its efforts and the information once we got the information on Monday morning as their, uh, their breakout and what their real concerns were, we immediately uploaded all these things uh, to the Internet so that people could follow. And so we're not out of the woods. You mentioned the dog park, and it's interesting that uh, you mentioned cooling places because we know that with climate change, um, we do need more cooling places as it gets hotter. Some of them, we used to open up libraries or whatever, and here we're going to do a dog park, but we can't do that. We can't clean up Marie Whitman Park, okay? People living in the bathrooms and tearing up the park, but the city can't get anybody out there uh, through uh, parks and recs to do anything about it. And no, so, they want to make sure that everybody uses the Get It Done app. Yeah. That is the, that is the um, way of the future for this mayor. He wants everything on the Get It Done app so that he's able to track. And then what also assists the um, constituents is if you call your council office with that tracking number. So that really helps. Um, they have come out to the community and I'm hoping that more community members, if they don't know how to use the get it done app, that they ask for a training. We have to use some of the tools that are in place now to get the things that you want. And so we have recreation advisory councils that have empty seats. We need people on our community planning groups because your voice is important and you need to be on 
things that are recognized by the city. The city has a master park plan and we need people that utilize the park, have a vision for the park in their community to get on those seats. Well, you know, one of the things I want to say is that uh, the question comes on is that how do we then get people, assign people to seats? Because it seems like we're not being fully represented or things are falling through the cracks. Is there an overall plan even from the community of saying, okay, we need somebody to be on this one, somebody to be on that one, so that we can make sure everything is covered? Well, normally all you need to do is you can go on the any council website mm -hmm. and they list all their planning group meetings. Some are on Zoom, some are hybrid, and some are in person. I can only speak to the Encanto Recreation Advisory. Mm -hmm. They ask you to come to two meetings and then your third meeting, you become a voting member of that advisory. Okay. And so it's very important to show up and get involved, get educated before you become the voting member, because that parks master plan is what we have to educate everybody on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we don't um, we, such a there's such an education job to be done. George Stevens started the uh, community councils, mm -hmm. but it was modeled after an experiment that came out of Washington, D.C., before I even came to California, and it was called Neighborhood Advisory Councils. And the Neighborhood Advisory Councils within districts divided, uh, subdivided districts into single-member tracks that were based on the census, and the census would have like 2,000 people to a census track. Okay. And so within my district, for instance, that I represented, I had three different neighborhood advisory councils that had these subdivisions that representatives were elected from. And so we haven't kept up because the difference is um, back east, these groups meet at night. It's like a night city government. They're making decisions. They're looking at stuff. They're drafting. And unfortunately, I keep saying in California, once the sun goes down, you know, if you ain't on the beach, everybody's kicking it. Um, and, and there's still work to be done. And then our people, many working people, they're working. They can't make meetings at all of these weird times. Mm -hmm. You know, families are working two or three jobs. And one of the classic examples of this is a lady who worked at the Hotel Dell as a maid, and she was sharing how she had to commute from National City because it was impossible for her to find any place to live on Coronado in relationship to her job. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we're doing and with your help, the way you're staying on this is that we just have to keep on pushing this. Uh, you remember, and a lot of us seem to have forgotten that last October, September, October, we had that uh, big report that came out of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Homelessness that talked about black San Diegos and homelessness with all kinds of recommendations and stuff. We spent about three issues of the paper detailing this. And, you know, and we, we're just trying to get people to get involved. So let's just, let's just jump right into it. Uh, lots of things are happening around the world. Lots of things are happening with gun control, uh, uh, people getting kicked out of office, put in office, people visiting the White House, people all upset about this. And, you know, uh, the young people are starting to make their voices heard. Let's get right here to San Diego and say, what's going on? Lots of changes, lots of moving that's going on. So, Ms. Maxwell, give us the lay of the land. What, what are we looking at right now? Right now, we're looking at everybody to remind themselves to check their voter registration card okay. because a lot of people had an, oppor had an opportunity to move. You know, we, um, the NAACP San Diego branch, they won the lawsuit against the Housing Commission to expand the Section 8 vouchers. And so we have a lot of community members that were able to go decide where they wanted to move for a better education for their children. Mm -hmm. But we have to remind people to change your card. Make sure that you're going to get your absentee ballot. So you always... We're going to have, like you said, some um, open seats. We're going to have some special elections. But we always want to make sure that we stay on the ready. And we're always, if you're moving, we want to make sure that you get that registration card changed so that you can always get your ballot. Now, I, I remember, Ms. Maxwell, uh, when you was your senior in high school, the first thing that you would get as a part of your graduation was a registration card. And you had the government class, and basically everyone who was qualified would fill out their voter registration card right then and there. Do we still have that in the school system? Doubt it. We don't have government classes 
but we do have a day of community service. And so we make sure that there's a voter registration table Mm -hmm. at different high schools and things like that. But anytime community members go out with their family, when you're at a a community event, there's Mm -hmm. always, I've been seeing somebody there trying to help register voters. So that's the one you have, you have a, uh, a thought process of about getting registered to vote. Oh, I do. I have a real strong one. But, you know, we've had voter registration cards every since last June. We have them right at the counter. We ask people to fill them out. We'll turn them in. Uh, Ms. Maxwell, you and I were talking the other morning on the pro- program about, uh, I was mentioning that there's a provision for homeless people yes. to register, and we're going to write that up and put it in the paper so people can see it. We give away enough papers to reach many of those people each week because we're doing the food distribution lines mm-hmm in terms of uh, various organizations with the ordinances and the pieces in there. And so all of those things come together to, to make an important difference in terms of getting information to people. Um, but I am, I am very concerned uh, because when you mention government, no, we don't have government classes. And the interesting contrast is that if you come to this country f- from a Spanish-speaking country, I remember you could turn on a Spanish television and there would be commercials for citizenship kits. Mm-hmm. And the citizenship kit was about $75. It taught you the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, whatever your local stuff was, the, who was a congressman, who was a senator, all of those things. And it is by design that our school system does nothing to help people understand that. So then when we want people to vote, it doesn't make any sense to them because they don't even remember. They have no memory. They're too young to know how people died for us to be able to vote. I used to have to count jelly beans in a jar to be able to vote. And and how you had to be able to recite stuff in a foreign language, even though the person making you do it couldn't speak the language themselves. Right. And and what, yeah. What would make me upset is that when you got the jelly bean right, they would take one out and eat it and said you was wrong. Yeah. You well, know? they didn't know how many was in the jar in the first place. They just show you a jar of jelly bean yeah. with the top yeah. one and say how many in there, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, and then they had the poll tax. You had to pay a tax to vote. Yeah. And now we don't have those things, but we are not voting. Mm-hmm. And I remind people that Dr. King in May of 1957, when he did the give me the ballot speech, mm-hmm. he made it very clear. He said, you give us the ballot. He says, we'll elect the right people that we need yeah. to get the system working. And we no longer seem to care about the system mm-hmm. until we have a problem. Yeah. Now, one of the things we want to say to people that are on the Zoom call, you can put your questions in. We are looking at the chat. If you have any questions and would like to jump in on this conversation, please do so. For those that want to call in, the number is 858-251-6111. Again, 858-251-6111. I want you to jump in. This is going to be, we're going to be using this time uh, from the designated editor to start going forth and looking at what political situation uh, are taking place in our own city. But I got to take a pause for the calls and ask the question, what's going on in New York with your, with, with, with your former president? <laughs> well, we know that the president is engaged in a civil lawsuit right now, mm-hmm. and the lady is suing him for sexual harassment. Uh, she says sexual assault, but in the court, her opening statement, she made it very clear today that, that Donald Trump raped her in a dressing room. And and Trump had tried to say he didn't know the lady. He had made derogatory comments when it first came up about she was ugly and she wasn't his type and all of that kind of stuff. But they got pictures and proof that she he did know her and he had seen her before. Mm-hmm. And he coerced her into the dressing room saying he was looking for a gift for someone. Hmm. And so um, she can't do the rape thing, but there's nothing stopping the civil suit Mm -hmm. that's going forth now. And they are going to be blocked because she wanted to bring in all these other women, 20-some women that had complaints. And I think his attorneys tomorrow will do something like a motion in limine and say uh, those things have no direct bearing and they can't come into this case. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that while this man is indicted in one situation, Mm -hmm. on trial for another, uh, indictment involves a porn star, and and he's still rising in the numbers. And the more Republicans jump into the race, the better his chances. Mm -hmm. That's why the president had to make his announcement. And while the Democrats support the president, they are afraid in terms of his age. And the real fear, unspoken, is that if he should drop dead and have a heart attack, Kamala Harris becomes president. That's the last thing in the world they want to see. Okay. And so we got all kinds of little dynamics going on nationally 
and we're gonna get to our local dynamics in a few minutes. But this is this is the real world. So, Miss Francine, uh, I want you to put your two cents on on Don Teflon Don, as I call him. Then I want to talk about some of the firings that took place this recently on two networks. Well, I was pretty surprised as everybody else that two millionaires were fired. Mm-hmm. I'm not concerned where they're going to land because mm-hmm. once again, they're millionaires. Mm-hmm. And as far as the former, mm-hmm. the former president, um, it's a it's a it's a testament to what people really think of character, ethics, and the fact that I look at his numbers. And it's it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. Our moral our moral compass has just broken down to this. Yeah, and I, and I think what really concerns me more than anything else, and I was having this conversation, um, that I want to see the Christian community come together and have a real dialogue because the Christian right is still supporting heavily, and they used to be the faith and ethics uh, party, and now it's uh, faith. Faith and ethics, as long as it doesn't go against us losing. Absolutely. Well, let's just clear this term Christian up, okay? Because it's the Christian term has been mis- mishandled. Okay. First, it got confused when Jimmy Carter was president, and he talked about uh, uh, being a Christian. And then the Pointer Institute, when they did their, their uh, I'm sorry, the Pew, the Pew Institute, when they did a thing about Christians, because Carter wrote a statement in uh, Playboy, an article, and he wrote up the term Christian. And so when the Pew Foundation looked into the whole concept of, uh, of Christianity, they decided there were two kinds of Christians. Mm-hmm. They decided that they were Christians and they were born-again Christians. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like to remind people that Jesus Christ was not a Christian, mm-hmm. okay? So we, our goal is to be Christ-like, not Christians. Mm-hmm. And so these people who were doing this stuff in the name of Christianity, they certainly are not Christ-like. Because you can just look in the book, follow the Gospels, and see what Christ-like is. Mm. And I contend that the real source of all of this is just blatant racism. Okay. You looked up one day, here they come, all these black, brown, yellow, funny-looking people. The white folks ain't having as many children as they used to. Oh, my God. Just like the 85-year-old shooting a black kid through the door. All he knew is they done come to my house. They coming for me. And, and bang, and he, you know, then you see the little kid with his saxophone. He was just trying to pick up his brother. Okay. So, <laughs> what point well taken. I'm going to shift because we have a question. <laughs> Good. It says, can you speak a little little about support for the people of Sudan? This comes from John Stump. Well, John, I know you would be bringing the Sudan into the issue. Um, you know, the Sudan, they got uh, all kind of battles over there in cartoon. They got two generals fighting each other. Hopefully they'll work it out. We can look at it. They got uh, over 2,000 Americans there. Some of them don't want to leave. They got people there with dual citizenship, both Sudanese and American. And we've offered some people a way out. All we can do is look at that from where we sit, uh, look at what America does through the State Department, and stay focused on what we got going on right here. Because I tell you, the issues we have going on here, uh, they might not be you know, with stars and stripes, but they're killing just as people just as quickly as the Sudan. Mm -hmm. In what, uh, 90 days of this year, we already had over 160 mass shootings. I would think that we right up there with Sudan. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm excited about, you know, just this real discussion. People are putting feed in, and it looks like very soon our special guest is going to come on, and uh, uh, we'll do that. So uh, let's just talk about our community. You know, uh, the service that we have been doing with Black Men and Women United, San Diego Voice and Viewpoint, GOD Radio, Mandate Records, uh, um, Francine, as I say, you know, um, I always tease you because I always say, you know, how they have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, They have Miss Maxwell, me, myself, and I, because for some reason you seem to be at every meeting that nobody else, none of us can make it to. So um, let's just talk about the community and how we can get more involved in this time. Well, I'm hoping that the community, once again, will pay close attention to the budget season, but also the fact that we have been labeled, again, one of the safest cities. It's a wonderful thing, but look at the budget and the budget increase if we're just so safe. Also, you have to think of things that are missing that the community took their time to vote on and rally the Citizens Advisory Board on Police Practice. 
that has not been brought forward by the city council. It's very important to hold the police accountable. We know that the data that Chief Neslight and the mayor just had a press conference in reference to, and you look at the data, they're stopping people less, but Mm -hmm. the increase is a problem Mm -hmm. because they're increasing. They're not stopping you for a traffic, but they're stopping you because of the fourth waiver. And so that's well within the scope of the police department and things mm-hmm. like that. But the community has to really get involved as it pertains to this budget. It's 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 a it's very interesting. Well, well, I, you know, I got to mention because mention, people don't understand the history of the fourth waiver issue. OK, OK. The, the fourth waiver issue goes back to a criminal case, Supreme Court case called Map v. Ohio. And in Map v. Ohio, this issue came up about stopping people and whether or not, if I'm remembering it correctly, you lawyers out there, don't get mad if I don't. Um, But it was a situation where it was decided that your car could be considered an extension of your home in terms of having it searched. Well, the Supreme Court weakened that when it came up and said, look, the policeman is going to have probable cause, and because of his training, his training gives him probable cause when he looks at you. So what do they do? When a black person gets stopped, First thing they ask you, are you fourth, are you fourth waiver or on probation? Because if you are, your rights are waived. And I don't believe in La Jolla where they pull over a white person that the first thing they ask them is that question. So that's racism. You know, it's, it, it goes back to what I don't call it driving while black. I call it living while black. Mm-hmm. That they, gonna, they just going to mess with you. The man that was shot 46 times uh, out of the 92 bullets that went after Jalen Walker, you know, all over a, a traffic, over a light being out or something. Mm-hmm. So this is the, the this is real. Well, we're here today, and and we actually have uh, our, our current council uh, uh, woman and president pro tem. Let me just tap on there. I got I got some new toys, and so uh, we, we're gonna make sure we get you all set up. Look look, look there, y'all y'all see it up there? Yes. Okay. And we all did right. and we did not start the discussion yet on the on. This whole electoral issue, because we were waiting for you. We didn't want you to, to miss anything that we were going to say. Okay, so you're good. We let people know you on your way. Well. All right. Well, first of all, uh, a good evening and welcome, and thank you for coming on. Uh, there's so much going on in our community. So can can you give us a snapshot of where we're at and, and, and what's really going on? Because everybody said, what's going on? <laughs> Well, Lynn, that's a loaded question. I think I, I came in at the tail end of a discussion about the budget that's going on at the city. Those hearings start um, May 3rd. That's um, next Wednesday. But um, politically, there is a lot going on, and that is because of the uh, announcement of resignation of um, Nathan Fletcher I, on May, May 15th. And I say announcement because um, he still has to formally do that, which not, has not been done. Um, and that's an important fact to keep in mind. And so that everyone, because of his announcement, is is expecting that on May 15th and planning accordingly. So the County uh, Board of Supervisors will be making a decision next Tuesday. And I believe the agenda just came out today as to whether they will fill this seat through an appointment or fill this seat through an election. So um, that's what's going on at, at that level. It's a very, um, we don't know what they're going, they're, they're going to do. Um, technically, we don't know what they're going to do. Um, but I did announce my bid yesterday. And so what I said was, if they go forward with the appointment, then I will apply for it, as will probably quite a, you know, a few other people. Um, if they go forward with a special election, I will run. And so it doesn't really matter um, which way they go as it pertains to what I'm going to try to do in obtaining that seat. Uh, but we have to also keep in mind that that the city of San Diego, if there is a seat that is vacated and there are more than 18 months left in that person's term, it automatically goes to election. Mm-hmm. Um, the county does not, they have a choice. And so they can technically put someone in that position to be the supervisor over district four, which many of us live in. It's larger than the council district, a lot larger for three and a half years. And so, um, you know, that, that leaves open the potential 
of a lot of meetings that we are not a part of and things that we're not seeing um, for, you know, to buy for that appointment for that seat. But, you know, they could go for a special election, and give people an opportunity to vote for who they want in in that district. So we we shall see. Well, let me augment what you're saying, um, uh, Madam Councilwoman. Uh, there's 625,000 people in Supervisorial District 4. And the good news is that uh, District 4 that you represent on the City Council is within District 4 of the Supervisorial District. So that's a strong reason why you should be the person if they do it. It's my understanding from talking to a couple of members that on Tuesday, the second, they're going to vote on the process and that's where they're going to make the decision whether it's going to be an appointment or an election. But if it's a, an appointment, that's when people have to start submitting names. So some people have already been uh, speaking as if they have it in the bag. And I, just for the record, I want to say they don't. And uh, members have not made that decision. The mm -hmm. unknown factor here that I want to put on the table is that Nathan Fletcher does not have to resign, number one. And there is a strong feeling that he's not going to resign. And if he doesn't resign, then the whole thing becomes academic. Why there's such a strong feeling that he's not going to resign? Because people feel, some people feel that he's got two and a half years. He can ride it out. He can, he can survive the court challenge because it's civil. It's not criminal at this point. And the only thing that can force him out of office, as I understand, would be a criminal conviction, um, which is not on the table because he hasn't been charged criminally with anything. There's also a feeling that a lot of this is the reason why he did the PTSD claim and uh, went out of state for treatment. And so if he doesn't step down, it's academic. Uh, but while we still have the possibilities and we need to be prepared, and I wanted to be uh, very clear that those of us at this table support you for the appointment, and we will support you if it comes to an election. And I'm glad you made the observation about the city because the, the difference I always like to remind people is that the city of San Diego is a sovereign entity and the county is sovereign. So the county has no authority over what the city does. And that's what makes us different than other cities that or other counties that might be general purpose counties that come on a whole different element in terms of the state constitution. And so yeah. these are very important little details here. And um, we got people rallying, all kinds of groups and elements. And we've got a few people in our community. Uh, they must have drank some Kool-Aid like the people from Heaven's Gate because uh, all of a sudden they standing up saying they speak for the community and all that. And I always like to remind them of that Indian ad uh, saying that he who leads where no one follows goes for a walk. So I'm going to make sure that the Board of Supervisors know that they don't represent nobody but themselves. Yeah. Uh, these people who are, are beginning to say uh, what they're going to do and what kind of deals they're going to make and as if they got it. Uh, it ain't going to happen. Well, one of the things I think that we have to be very strategic um, at this point and we cannot be quiet about it. Um, I think that it is important that we, we speak up and we speak very loudly uh, because, you know, in any time that, you know, in politics people are trying to place and get their person in place, um, but their person is not always the person of the community. Uh, and, and one that serves and that has shown that they will serve and they will have the best interest, you know, um, moving into, uh, and I'm going to say it uh, prophetically, moving into a larger role, what, what do you see as some of the things that you would like to institute from the supervisory seat uh, that you could not do in the city because of the area? First of all, let me just say, um, Dr. Warren, thank you for your support. Um, that that really does mean a lot. Um, so what I have seen a lot at being, you know, at the city and in the capacity of an elected official for almost five years now is the opportunity to work better with the county. The top issue that is on everyone's mind and also what we are seeing is homelessness and the city has a responsibility, as Dr. Warren said, we are a charter city. So that that gives us, we take our rights sort of away from the county of making a lot of decisions for us, but we have our the right to make decisions about how we will use our land, land use and building. And that is what 
really in the game um, or in uh, with regard to homelessness, that's what we are charged to do. We are charged to build more homes because with that, you know, the cost does go down and also we're able to house people. What the county has that we do not have is a social service infrastructure. They have health and human services. They have a child welfare. They have behavioral uh, health services. We have none of that. And we are often asked to provide those services. And as a matter of fact, some of the things that I have brought forward um, include wraparound services and the like, because we know that that reduces crime. Um, but we don't have the infrastructure at the city to do that. So I am in a very unique position for a lot of reasons. One is because I've seen the gaps because I've been inside and seen what it would take to have an actual collaboration. Um, two, because I have been through the system at the county. I have had to stand in line and wait for resources. My mother had to take out IHSS, in-home supportive services, to take care of me when I was sick. So not only have I you know, done many of the things that I've done at the city, that the county has then taken and passed on their own, um, using my legislation as an example, but I also have on the other side of it, been in the system. So I have seen where the gaps are from a personal perspective, but I think I have the professional experience to you know, help to try to change those things. You know, right now, the, where we are in society is a very interesting time because we are, you know, it's a hurry up and go state of mind um, when government is still a bureaucracy. And so we have to continue to dig deep. Everything's not going to be an initiative. Everything is not going to be in the news. As a matter of fact, the real work is done when nobody is really seeing it. And so that's what I want to do with the county, dig a lot deeper into those systems and see, you know, what those disparities are and, and change those, those systems to make them more efficient for the people that need them. Ms. Maxwell, you have thoughts on any of this? You, 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 you know, you, you're at the heart of so much of this stuff. Well, thank you so much for taking time. Um, I'm thinking you're out of town. Is it reparations time? <laughs> no, I'm not out of town. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the house. But I had a meeting before this, but okay. I will be. Um, so reparations, we have our second to last meeting before we sunset on May 6th in Oakland. And on Saturday, this Saturday, we will be at ECC with another member of the task force who is coming down from L.A. Okay. And we will have a panel where we will be discussing our progress so far, you know, where we are, what the community community can ex expect, and also just to ask questions, you know, and answer questions about, you know, what what we can expect coming from this process. So, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about uh, welcoming the chair, Chair Camila Moore, to San Diego again. Um, the task force members had a good time in San Diego. Um, and so she will be back on this Saturday at ECC. I believe it's at one o'clock um, to to go over. If, if where I we, may, where we are. Um, Madam Chairperson and Ms. Maxwell, mm -hmm. I just want to again uh, point out that whoever the, the the task force has hired to do media, they have not at any point been in touch with Voice and Viewpoint or GOD Radio. And I understand they're making reports about what they're doing for media outreach. Uh, around the state because I'm following it in all the meetings. They have mm -hmm. never come near us for anything. And I can't believe that this thing was structured with such importance without outreach because if you had enough money to hire somebody to do media, then it should have been enough money for us to notify the community of the meetings. If you hadn't mentioned this meeting right now, we wouldn't know about it. Yeah, and it's it's been... Um... It has been a struggle. I think this is our third or fourth company. Um, there, It has been a challenge on a lot of different fronts, but we do, we are staffed by the DOJ and that does bring in complications, not necessarily when it comes to the legal framework and you know the other things that we're doing, but anything with regard to outreach, I mean, 
and you've been following it, but this, the things that we have had to go through and, and still feeling like not everybody who needs to know about what is going on knows, you know? Um, so I, I will, you know, I'm going to take that back um, and pass along the, the information yeah. as far as contact information, for sure. I will um, have my team do that for sure. But remind, that, remind that them to read the Administrative on. Procedures Act under the state constitution because due process, uh -huh. that's where it's found. So it can't be, we got difficulty and we can't find folks. If they're going to be as legal as they pretend to be with what you're doing, they need to read that act. And then they need to make sure that they're reaching us because we have very vested interest here. And I can assure you, if we were Japanese and they were doing restitution for the encampment scenario, they would find all of us and what property we had and what happened in the whole bit. So we're not going to beat up on you about it. We're we here to do another issue because there's some more, more pieces to this that I don't want to uh, hog the time. I, I, I want to ask a question. Um, um, as you uh, uh, move forward into a new position, what things do you still get to stay involved in and what things do you have to turn over to your predecessor when it comes down to either reparations or boards that you now represent and, um, and you represent us as, as our leader um, for the community? What ones stay and which one have to go? So reparations would stay with with me because that that is not something that I do solely in the in the city. capacity of a city council member. So outside boards like that would stay with me. But I because I was not appointed to that board by um, my the, my city council colleagues or the council president. That was something that was supported from the uh, appointed from the state sure. level. Uh, Tony Yak is appointing me to that position. So that would not change. Um, other than the fact, remember that we're sunsetting on June 30th, mm -hmm. and so um, that that role in its current capacity may disappear. It may not because there is a bill to extend. Mm -hmm. um, but everything that I do, from being budget chair as I am right now, first African American woman to do that at the city, um, my committee vice chair of public safety, MTS. Uh, reinvestment task force which has actually had some success this year with getting um granted down payment assistance to members of the bipoc community um all of those things would would no longer be my responsibility there would also be a question as to what is left to a predecessor just simply because there has to be a process by the entire council to vote on those those particular appointments well, um, so Go ahead. One item would still be your responsibility because the reinvestment task force is co-chaired by the full supervisorial member Correct. and the city council member. So Correct. You would, but you would just would shift be, hats with that. Yes. And, and I would assume that I would be attached to the reinvestment task force and that I would be attached to the San Diego Workforce Partnership still. But there would still have to be a process by which the board of supervisors appoints me to that because right now I'm serving as a representative from the city council. But the reinvestment task force goes with the seat. So you automatically get that by coming into the full supervisorial seat as opposed to the others that you're mentioning. I spent six years well, there. Well, the seat. reinvestment task force, I serve on that with Joel Anderson. With who? Joel Anderson. Joel Anderson. Well, they must have delegated mm -hmm. to him because it goes to, yeah. it goes to the fourth district. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's seat. what I'm saying. That yeah. it was, it was they they made that decision. It it used to be District Four, the two District Fours, but yeah. it is well, it, is, it is not currently right now. So, um, so that that's what would change. You know, it's a it, it's a larger group, so um, community um, events and attendance would be within the City Council District, but outside of that, it goes all the way up through to Claremont and out east to Rancho San Diego. So that, you know, that would change a little bit, you know, just as far as broadening that and expanding that. Uh, but the goals stay the same. The platform is the same because with that platform, it doesn't re really matter where I go. It is, you know, the platform stay and the goals stay. Well, and I, I just want to make it clear that, you know, this is not, um, this is 
this is a hard road for me, no matter which way it goes, because I have decided to hold law enforcement accountable. So wherever I go, their union will follow. Okay, I don't, keep, I don't want to cut you off, but we got so yeah. much elements to add to this. Yeah. And, and um, gee whiz, I was about to lose my thought. It was, a, it was an important piece I was going to bring up. It was related to, oh, I know what it was. The, uh, the Board of Supervisors is in the process of looking for a, a new chief administrative officer. And Helen Robin Myers was, was kind enough to, ex, to uh, delay her retirement to come back to be during this period. And Ms. Maxwell, you have an idea of that because you should be, or uh, our fourth representative should have say so about that. The you, whole process should start over. Yes. It um, should not be someone that automatically they're sitting there waiting, um, and there's is a, it's about party lines. This is about constituents and nonpartisan. What's best for the entire region of the of San Diego, and the person that they want to select, but they need Nathan to be here to vote. The whole process should start over. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I have looked the person up um, just because I, when I heard that this was a decision that was in the work that they were making. You know, I think that it is important not for someone to be steeped necessarily in operations, but for them to have some sort of operations experience. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times in the big bureaucracy, you don't know what you don't know if you've never been there um, and you haven't experienced that. And, and coming from an elected official side, there's a lot that goes on in operations that we just don't know. You know, so I, so my my concern that I also brought up to people was that I didn't see that experience, and I think for me, I would need to know more about that type of experience in particular because I just think that it's very important. I know that there has been a process. I have no idea how muddy that process has been, based on you know Nathan's participation in it, or you know who did what, but I, you know, for me, operations is very important. Having a CAO that is, that is um, not playing party lines, but that is wants to do the best for the county and for the organization is very important. I just don't, I haven't been through the process, so I don't know if this is the person or not. So I don't want to say it's not the person, but I yeah. also, you know, if, if it were me coming into the seat, I would be at the tail end of that process which generally speaking, I don't like to be. I don't like to have okay. to make decisions. Okay, but I'm a, I got to cut your answers a little short, uh, Ms. Montgomery, because we got so much to still get in these few minutes. I just want to make this observation on that point, that there are five districts. Most people in San Diego have no idea how big San Diego County is, okay? They don't have any idea that Health and Human Services is the largest agency within the county, or they don't have any idea of the size of the budget or how each of the members get so much in terms of discretion or the services that are provided to the unincorporated smaller places uh, in the county, which, which say, for instance, like uh, a Lemon Grove is a city, but it doesn't have a police force, so it contracts like national, like Oceanside. So they got all of these elements there. And uh, Helen Robbins Myers, as far as I know, was the first woman to occupy this position. So I think that having worked <clears throat> at the county and, and when I did work in, in county council, I did uh, legal opinions that involved the whole county. I think it's very important that we look at the county in terms of its structure and lay layout and that we ask some real questions because the people who were there before, they didn't come from any county experience. They came from uh, Walt, what's his name? He came from the private sector. He right. was a, 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 a executive of a, a multi a billion dollar entity, million dollars, whatever it was. So um, we just wanted to be, we need to have the people know, especially Ms. Vargas, the chairperson, that we are concerned about who they're going to put in that position. Okay. We, we've only had one black man occupy that position. That was Cliff Graves. And Cliff Graves came to us in the eighties from the office of management and budget. And he, he did a great job in terms of being there. But we really need them to know coming in the door that that it, you want some, you got some questions, um, and it's more than just operation because it's the it's the mentality 
and the heart of the person that's going to count just as much in terms of how we're going to be affected. Well, well, I bring up operations because I think there's a sentiment among a lot of the people at the county that this person does have what you talk about, which is the heart and the ability to change the culture. I, I still think in order to change the culture, you got to know what you're, what you're dealing with when you go in. Because the people are, you know, before you know it, you're three years in and they haven't been telling you the truth about something. That's just the reality of how big government, you know, how it is. So I, I just, I, I agree with you, but I think that both are important. I agree. We we'll, we we'll agree. Uh, the, the clock is running on us. So, Ms. Maxwell, you got additional observations because the county is so much, got your hands in so many things. We got Live Well Center that's going to open in July. We got uh, issues that we're watching that center very closely. We got to watch the probation department, even though we got the sister there, uh, because we we made commitments. There's not going to be a police force. Yeah. So, I think for me, um, just bringing it back to the city of San Diego, as it pertains to Malcolm X Library, we have had to be subjected to wood on our windows far too long. So what is your stance on educating the community? Because our community doesn't understand the strong form of mayor government. And so if you could just spend a few minutes um, dealing with that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good example. I had to, to make, I, I took a personal call and had to deal with that this week. So I will have an update on that in particular. But that is an example of a larger, some larger issues. And so as trying to be as quick as I can, you know, what we do on that dais um, as, a, as a legislature, um, as nine council members, has nothing to do with implementation. So we pass the laws that we think will help the city, but, you know, the devil is in the details. And when you get over to that implementation side, how things roll out is really an executive function. And so we can pry and prod on that, but we do not have the power to make things go the way that the mayor does. And that's just the reality of our system. Do I wish it was a little different? Yes, I do. Um, was it different back in the day when there wasn't, wasn't a strong mayor? Absolutely. And the mayor was sitting right there on the dais with the other city council members. It is completely different now. So even if the mayor brings something and, you know, to us, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to be there, you know, to, uh, for nine hours of public comment. Um, we do, and that that's fine. We sign up for it, but it is very different because we can say we want something, but if it's over on the other side of the house, then it really is up to our relationships, and it's you know, well, it's up to the mayor um, and how you know we he executes and how he prioritizes. Well, let me point out something there because this is important. Under the strong mayor form of government, uh, the mayor has uh, a chief operating officer. When in other cities under that same uh, format, that person is called a chief administrative officer, just like the county chief administrator. He's got five divisions of the city under him. The problem is in other areas, he has all kinds of authority uh, as an extension of the mayor, including the ability to fire people. And what we have here is a person who's been hired in a job uh, without the community understanding his job because he's the person who should be moving on the implementation since he's over all of the divisions. And you still have uh, that person there in the office uh, that was given a contract over the midway development, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, which is usurping some of the authority. And so we never had a real education program, Ms. Maxwell, for what a strong mayor form of government is. And that was by design. Those little, little white men who made the transition didn't want you to know how it's supposed to work. And, and we need, we got to fill in that, that, that void. You can't do it alone, but we've got to start having, if it's our community meetings, we got to start having meetings and, and, and educating people as to how it works. Because without them understanding, uh, your job can't be successfully done and we won't ever get all of what we should have. No, I, I agree. And little by little, I think the council um, has tried to build a stronger council but you know when when you do need five and six votes to go go your way, and your relationships do depend on, um, you know how you're getting along with the mayor and stuff, then that is very hard to do. And just to be frank, it's it's hard to do. Uh, it can be done, but it hasn't been done yet. So yeah. 
you know, that's just the situation that we're in. But understanding from the community and education um, is is important because then we can we can work together to, to get things done in the community. Well, I, I'm going to jump in here, and, and this is my last uh, last because the time is, is going very quickly. So moving forward, uh, uh, lots of things on the plate. What do you need from the community now? What do you need from your supporters now? What do you need so that we could move forward smoothly um, and seamlessly? Oh, that's a good question. May, May 2nd is the day, and the reason why I'm huffing and puffing is because um, we we do not know which way they're they're going to go. And usually if, if they do an appointment, that lessens the chances. Because I will say this, when we experience with council presidency, the institutions and the establishment usually don't choose me. The only reason why I'm there is because of the people. That's it. From the very beginning, the establishments did not choose me. And so I, I'm a little concerned about that and how we as a community approach May 2nd. Should it be, hey, we want a special election or should it be, you know, if you appoint, um, we want you to appoint somebody that represents the, the, the supervisorial district. So, you know, that is something that we have to, uh, you know, I'll be calling y'all. I pretty much have most of y'all's number on this, um, on this, and I know other people are watching. But May 2nd is a very, very important day. Well, we agree, uh, Ms. Maxwell, we talked about this on Black Men and Women United, that people can't wait to next week. They need to start writing letters right now saying, yeah. if it's an appointment, we want Council Member Monica Montgomery Step appointed. And if there's an election, uh, she's going to run for it, and we're going to support her for it. Um, and some people on the other side say, well, if you got an election, you don't really have the numbers, the Mexicans and the other people in the community, they'll be able to rally more numbers. If we're going to have an election, that's why in addition to the letters being written, we got to have people starting a voter registration campaign now so that we can count the new registrants just like they did in Atlanta uh, when right. they were uh, trying to overcome. But but uh, but I represent you know district four is what it is and we did come away with sixty nine percent of the vote the, the the representation I think we have an argument that is for everybody I'm just proud to be a black woman and I will never apologize for that but that doesn't mean just like any other person of any other race that you can't represent everybody oh we know and you so, can we know you can no and, just... and I'm just saying it's just an argument that we can yeah. make um, in the process yeah. yes and that's a good point. But I think strategically, we just all need to come together as a community and have a community conversation. There has been too many people having backdoor conversations, meeting with our bo county board of supervisors. I bumped into um, Supervisor Joel Anderson, and he was heartbroken to know that many of the 4th Council District Supervisory has not received their proclamations that they were entitled to from Councilwoman Nora Vargas's office because of their non-responsiveness. So those are the kinds of things that we need to make sure that each other knows that although you're looking to the chair, the chair is falling short. And so why would you let her steer the boat to pick who should represent you and be your voice? So I'm asking all the listeners and other people's constituent bases, let's come together and have a community conversation and push forward together. Because let me be clear, can't nobody win without the black votes because we vote in every election. Well, not only that, you're very, you're very right that we do vote in every election. And it's uh, Joel Anderson has indicated, I had a conversation with him. If there's anyone that's waiting on a proclamation uh, that they uh, can't get because Fletcher's not there, all they have to do is be in touch with his office and he has volunteered he said they don't mean to overstep the, the chair, but he has volunteered to pick up the slack to make sure people get whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Just for the record, uh, council member, uh, black men and women united in the voice and viewpoint has offered to uh, hold such a meeting that everyone could come to. Uh, we know we can do it at the George Stevens Center. Um, I know that uh, Kathleen Harmon is trying to do some kind of a meeting, but she's doing that as an extension of the San Diego County Democratic Party. And we're not talking about party labels here. We're talking about people registering to vote. And I like for people to remember in California, there are more registered independents than Republicans. And so we don't care how you register. 
but we need to know that people are going to vote. Miss Maxwell registered some 18 people last week. She's out there with the cards. And everybody needs to get those cards and start doing that. We need to get those letters in. If it's no more than we want, Monica, uh, that they have those letters there next week when they meet on the 2nd. And we want Monica and we want an election. We want those two things. And if we can't have the election, we want Monica appointed. Well, Dr. Warren, we have we have come to the end of our time. I want to make sure that um, uh, uh, Council President Pro Tem will have some final words. But I also want to say that I want to thank each and every one of you all for making time today. This is what we call responsiveness. When 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 we put the call out and we get you know uh, the response, and we want to thank you because we know that your day has been uh, uh, long and extensive. Uh, but you have you've been here, and we thank you for. And I'm just going to be on respect for. The, the, the media that we, we represent uh, to, to get the word out. So final comments, I'll pitch it back to Dr. Warren, pitch it back to... Uh, I'm pitching to Ms. Maxwell because okay. I didn't talk so much. Okay. <laughs> I just want to request Council President Pro Tem, because you have an extensive newsletter, if you can just remind everybody about ECC, because when we were at San Diego State, we welcomed everybody. We loved our guests coming from out of town, but we also want to show them that San Diego will show up and show out for a reparations meeting. So if you could be so kind as to make sure that there's an extra newsletter that goes out to remind everybody, I'd be, I'd be greatly appreciated. Ms. Maxwell, it went out today. Um, I think it's around three o'clock. So if you, um, it went out today via email blast. So um, if you didn't get that, look, check your spam box or anybody, not not just you, Betsy, but okay. anybody check. But if you didn't get a get it, let us let us know because we did took special care to send out an email blast today, Great. and we'll be continuing to to have it out there because you're right, we want to have a good showing. Any final statements? Thank you, everyone. I love my community. I love you all. Um, this is a hard fight. Do not get discouraged for what is to come. Um, let's stick together and build real power in San Diego. It's time. Dr. Warren. Thank you for being with us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you have it. This is from the desk of the editor right here on GOD Radio 1. You all have a blessed, blessed evening.